Good day everyone, I'm Viel Matthew Hawson and in this podcast I would try to discuss what I have learned in our medieval philosophy class. This podcast is lovingly dedicated to our professor in ancient and medieval philo, Dr. Calano, whom we call Rabon. Uh, this video would tackle about the relationship of faith and reason. Uh, in understanding the relationship between faith and reason, we must take into mind that the understanding develops as time also progresses and went by. The discussion of the relationship between faith and reason has been greatly and lively discussed during the long medieval era, when the church has a strong influence over the society. Before, faith and reason are two distinct and different things. Faith and reason met all because of St. Paul when he arrived in Athens in order to proclaim the good news. The Acts of the Apostles, we can see how the philosophers, specifically the Epicureans and the Stoics, have requested Paul to explain to them what seems to them as Paul's philosophy. Paul answered them not philosophically, but through preaching of the good news. Philosophers who were searching for the truth were now acquainted with the truth himself, Jesus Christ, through Paul's evangelization, as Dr. Kalano would say. Uh, in respect to this, Dr. Kalano would stress also to us that faith and reason need not to meet, but they met. After this episode, the relationship of faith and reason would be further nourished by St. Justin Martyr between the 1st and 2nd century. Justin Martyr would claim Jesus Christ is the Logos, or the Word, or the Principle. In simpler words, Justin Martyr proposes that Jesus is the answer to philosophical questions. Justin Martyr, in his dialogues with Trifo, agrees that philosophy leads us to God, he said. Philosophy is indeed one's greatest possession is most precious in the sight of God, to whom it alone leads us and to whom it unites us, Dialogue chapter 2. However, it should be noted that Justin Martyr and Christians before him think that Christianity is not just another philosophy, but a sure way to encounter the truth. By the time the 4th century arrived, there are a lot of confusion so as to who Christ really is. Our understanding of Christ affects how we come to know of our salvation. Centuries before, there has been no need of reasoning so as to prove the identity of Christ since the first-hand witnesses of Jesus Christ are still alive during those times and that the identity of Christ is self-evident to them. Now that in the 4th century all the first-hand and second-hand witnesses of Christ have died, there arose different understandings of who Christ really is. In order to settle this once and for all, Christians all around have met to an ecumenical council so as to discuss, discuss the identity of Christ. It should be noted that in these councils, councils, reason and faith again met. Faith used reason, specifically terminologies and way of reasoning out in order to articulate and understand more clearly Christ's identity. After the Roman Empire fell to the barbarians, philosophy survived from the barbarian invasion and continued to flourish inside the monasteries. Thanks to the monasteries during those times that they copied and recovered ancient texts of Plato and Aristotle. The monks studied these philosophies within the Christian culture vis-a-vis -vis the church fathers. One of the church fathers the monks studied and preserved is St. Augustine, the bishop of Hippo during the demise of the Roman Empire. In his works, Augustine sees faith as a means to search for his own ultimate meaning, which can be found in God. Particularly in his confessions, he recalls his conversion from being pagan, who lavishes, lavishes himself of worldly pleasures, to a heart that finds its rest in God alone. Augustine would say to us that his journey towards his conversion is driven by his unquiet heart that seeks rest. The Confessions of St. Augustine will tell us of his conversion from inordinate self-love from his childhood to pursuit of wisdom after he read Hortensius, to finding an answer from the Manichaeans which did not suffice him, to Neoplatonism until his heart found rest in Christianity. Thus, he has seen that faith answers the question philosophy tries to ask and tries to open to us another reality that seeks to be understood. That is why, after the Confessions, 
He also wrote treatises, the Civitate Chivita, the Dei, the Trinitate, and many more that is much more concerned than faith. As I have said earlier, it was during the long medieval era that the relationship of faith and reason continued to flourish, all because of the monasteries who serves as sites of enlightenment during the dark ages of barbarian invasion. One tradition that flourished during these dark times is the mystical tradition. Thinkers during these times, which are mostly monks and mystics, affirm that yes, while we can articulate Christian faith within philosophy, it should also be kept in mind that the reality of God cannot be contained within concepts and conceptions. There are two ways of speaking of God. First, the cataphatic way which affirms what God is. However, we should keep in mind that by saying that God is benevolent, we acknowledge that we only use concepts and metaphors in order to describe God. The second way of speaking of God is the apophatic way which claims what God is not. So the Dionysius describes and articulates best the mystic's view on God between the 5th and 6th century. So the Dionysius before embarking in God acknowledges man as someone who is limited and is clouded from the light of God. In his prayer, so the Dionysius would say God as someone that is surcharging our blinded intellects with the utterly impalpable and invisible fairness of glory surpassing all beauty. Later on, he would claim that we cannot come to full knowledge of God because God is super essentially exalted above created things, and that we can only speak of him of what he is not. Now, when we speak of God as omnipotent, we first acknowledge that, yes, God is all-powerful, but at the same time speak of God as not omnipotent since we acknowledge that God is far more beyond our human conception of being all-powerful. We claim such claim for God because God is not any of the things that can be perceived by the senses, but is far more beyond than that. After the mystical tradition, there emerged another thinker during the long medieval era that somehow shifted the inquiry about the relationship between reason and faith. From the reason that faith grants to the inherent rationality of faith, St. Anselm of Canterbury demonstrated this shift of thinking in his work Proslodion. Anselm's proslogion consists of invitation to prayer, proofs of God's existence, the divine attributes, the turning point of a wider concept of God, God as Trinity, and the joy of finding and further searching of God. Saint Anselm in his proslogion echoes eloquently Saint Augustine's cry, I believe so that I may understand, but also articulates his faith in a manner reason articulates it. It is, in it is in his enumeration of the divine attributes and the way he reasons it out that we can see Anselm's attempt to show to us faith's inherent rationality while also admitting that we may not accept his reasoning unless we believe. Thus, as a fruit of his quest of understanding God, Anselm does not only understand God as id quo maius cogitare nequit, but as id quo maior sit quam cogitare posit. After St. Anselm, there emerged a significant seeming dichotomy between faith and reason that led to a more intense discussion of their relationship. What lies in question in here is the authority of faith or authority of reason to be the source of knowledge specifically of God, since there are knowledge arrived from faith that is far different from the knowledge arrived from reason. In order to answer these questions, some philosophers proposed a solution to this problem but has not given enough and convincing answer. In the 13th century, St. Thomas Aquinas settled once and for all the problem of faith and reason by synthesizing philosophers from the medieval era. He understood that both faith and reason provide truth about God. In his Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas writes, Some things true of God are beyond all the competence of human reason, as that, as that God is three and one. Uh, that is what uh, faith provides us. Other things there are to which even human reason can attain as the existence and unity of God, which philosophers have proved to a demonstration under the guidance of the light of natural reason. While taking into mind that the divine is beyond human reason, St. Thomas Aquinas acknowledges that man can also come up with the knowledge of the divine reason, of the divine through reason. That is what he calls natural theology. And that's it for some of the philosophers we have discussed in Medieval Philo who tried to articulate the relationship between faith and reason. Thank you for watching and listening.
please don't forget to like and subscribe.